to get back to normalization yeah we were looking at functional dependency and and the key point that i noted is that a functional dependency is not a property of the current data in a database it's a property that you expect to hold always now what kinds of things can we do with functional dependencies well you when you use primary key dependencies that is a special case of functional dependencies again i think most people are aware of this so if you have a um, particular key functionally determining all the attributes of a schema then that key is a super key and then a candidate key is a minimal one so what that says is if that key determines all attributes in the schema but no subset of it determines the whole schema then it's a candidate key and finally uh, you choose one of the candidate keys as primary key but of course there are things which functional dependencies can express which super keys primary keys and so forth cannot express for example in this bad schema which we had id does determine um, name salary and department name and in fact it also uh, indirectly it also determines building and budget but department name only determines building and budget so it's not a super key but there is a functional dependency department name to building so now how do we use functional dependencies uh, there's some notation here we will say that a uh, particular relation is uh, legal if it satisfies functional dependencies um and we will use the terminology a functional dependency f or a set of functional dependencies holds on r if all legal relations on that schema satisfy those functional dependencies so name functional determining id may happen to hold true on an instance but it you cannot guarantee it you may have two in people with the same name so you cannot say this holds in general again this uh, notation of trivial functional dependencies you probably already know about it a trivial functional dependency is one which will hold on all possible relation instances in particular uh, uh, instance is trivial a uh, functional dependency is trivial if it's of this form alpha determines beta where beta is a subset of alpha now obviously when you say two tuples agree on alpha then beta is a subset so obviously they have to agree on beta also so this will hold on any possible instance so it's trivial there are of course many many such trivial dependencies how many are there if you have n attributes you can take any subset for the left and any subset of that for the right and that is a trivial functional dependency so there are a lot of trivial functional dependencies so one of the problems when you try to do practical stuff with functional dependencies is uh, if you try to do it exhaustively there are way too many to enumerate so what we want to do is restrict our algorithms to a smaller set of dependencies there's another notion of closure so given a set of functional dependencies we can infer more dependencies so as an example if we know that a functionally determines b and b functionally determines c so then we can infer that a functionally determines c why is this true if two tuples have the same a value the first dependency means they have the same value for b now if they have the same value for b the next dependency means they have the same value for c therefore we can infer that whenever two things agree on a they also agree on c so a determines c must hold so this is a dependency which we have inferred logically so the set of all functional dependencies logically implied by a given set of function dependencies f is called the closure of f so if there are many such things in there uh, it's a very large set in general you don't want to compute that whole set but conceptually it's important to understand what this set is it's everything which is implied by this and you can even uh, say that every trivial dependency is in here because it's implied by any set of functional dependencies so the closure is very large but we will use this a uh, notion of a closure in several contexts we will denote by f plus the closure of f it's of course a superset of f everything in f has to be in the closure so now let's see how we use this thing again you no doubt familiar with this just to refresh your memory 
What is the Boyce chord normal form? It says something about the relations. So what it says is, a relation is in Boyce chord normal form with respect to a particular set f of functional dependencies. So somebody has determined that these are the dependencies that should hold. And now you check if the relation is in BCNF. If for all functional dependencies in F plus, because the definition is with respect to this very large set. But there are many times when we can get away with not actually enumerating the whole set. But the definition is with respect to F plus. For everything in F plus, let's take a particular one, alpha determines beta, where both alpha and beta, of course, have to be subset of R. So these are uh, dependencies on this schema. One of these two should hold. Either alpha determines beta is trivial, that is, beta is a subset of alpha, or alpha is a super key. So what does it mean? It determines everything else. So what does it rule out? It rules out the possibility of having a functional dependency whose left hand side is not a super key of the whole relation. This is exactly the kind of thing we saw when we combined instructor with department. What happened there? Department name function determines uh, building and budget. But department name is not a super key for the instructor department relation. It, of course, doesn't determine the instructor. So this dependency shows, it's a witness to show that that particular relation is not satisfying Boyce chord normal form. And it's obvious that when you have such a dependency, um, then you have a possibility of redundancy. Why? Because the left hand side here, department name, can up, keep, appear multiple times in here. If it can, if it is a super key, it can only occur once. But if it is not a super key, it can occur multiple times. And each of the times it occurs, the building and budget have to be the same. Therefore, there is redundancy. Boyce chord normal form rules out this kind of redundancy. There are other kinds of redundancy with multi-valued dependencies, which it does not rule out. It's not the ultimate in any sense. But it rules out if it satisfies, if a particular schema satisfies DC enough, this kind of redundancy can be avoided. I mean, there are other kinds of redundancy between relations and so forth, which this does not target. So now, how do you um, come up with a schema which is in BCNF? And the standard way is to start with whatever schema you have given, check if it is in BCNF. If not, you will find some dependency which shows that it is not in BCNF, and now you decompose it. And the important thing is that the decomposition should be lossless join. If it's lossy join, that's you're losing information. So what we want is a series of steps each of which guarantees lossless join decomposition, such that at the end, the relation, the final set of relations satisfies BCNF. So the basic decomposition is actually very straightforward. Uh, given a particular uh, dependency, alpha determines beta, which uh, violates BCNF. What does that mean? Alpha is not a super key. Then we decompose R into two relations. One is alpha union beta. The other is R minus beta minus alpha. So what are we doing? We want to retain all the attributes of alpha in the second relation. Uh, but the attributes which are only in beta can be removed. So what have we achieved? In the, in the previous case, um, the department name determining building and uh, budget that gets pulled out into one relation, department name building budget. And this part, R minus beta minus alpha, in this case, beta and alpha is disjoint. So beta minus alpha is just beta. That gives you department name. Uh, sorry, uh, this part, beta minus alpha is building budget. That gets removed. And what is left is department name. Um, and so we have uh, ID, name, salary, and department name. What is common between these two department? In general, alpha is common between these two relations. So what can we say now? If alpha is common, 
alpha is a is a super key of the other relation. So what we can say is after you decompose and remove duplicate tuples, of course, um, we can say that if you take the second relation, take a particular tuple here, it will match only one tuple of this first relation. So in general, lossy decomposition gives rise to extra tuples. In this case, the functional dependency ensures that this will match only one tuple, so you cannot get any extra tuples. That's the intuition. So in general, when you have a decomposition like this, uh, there's some slides coming up on it, when you have a decomposition where the common attributes form a super key of one of the two relations, the decomposition is lossless. And so this particular decomposition in this manner will be lossless. And the basic idea is we keep doing this until the final things are um, no longer violating BCNF, you're done. Now sometimes, uh, you know, you want to worry not only about uh, redundancy, but you might want to ensure e efficiently that the given set of relations after you decompose, you should be able to check functional dependencies on those. Why is that? A functional dependency is a constraint on the schema, right? If you have a decomposition, which you've got somehow, and now you add a tuple to it, how do you know that does not cause a violation of some functional dependency? What do I mean by violation of functional dependency? I've decomposed. If I join it back, I'll get back the relation I started with. Now, there was some functional dependency on that relation. I should not be allowing a new tuple, uh, a, a state of the decomposed schema, where if I join back, the result will violate the functional dependency. I have allowed an inconsistent data to come into the uh, database, because it violates the functional dependency. So how do I check this? Okay, one way is I can, every time I do an update, I do a join again, and then check if the update causes a violation of a functional dependency in the joined result. As you can imagine, this is very expensive. Doing this on every join is very, very expensive. What is easier is to be able to check this on individual relations in the decomposed schema. So it would be good if I did not have to do a join in order to check a functional dependency. Is this possible? The answer is, first of all, after doing the decomposition, I can infer a number of functional dependencies on the individual relations. Each of these can be checked efficiently because it's a local to that relation. The question is, if I can check these, can I show that all the original dependencies that I started with will also hold? Okay. If a particular dependent decomposition is such that all the local checks will guarantee the original set of uh, dependencies will hold, then I can check for functional dependencies efficiently. Okay. Such a decomposition is dependency preserving. Okay, so this is what it says. It, it is, if it is sufficient to test only those dependencies on each individual relation in order to ensure that all the functional dependencies hold, then the decomposition is dependency preserving. We'll see a more formal specification of this, but this is the intuition. And DCNF, it turns out, it's not always possible to get a, de a dependency preserving BCNF decomposition. So certain, uh, in certain situations, people are willing to allow redundancy to allow efficient checking of functional dependency. It's a trade-off. It's not ideal, but you may want to have the ability to make that trade-off between this or that. So either case, you lose something. In one, you have to store redundant data and make sure it is up to date. But you can efficiently check for violation of functional dependency. In the other case, there is no redundancy, but you may allow erroneous data to come into the database. That's the trade-off. Third normal form is this alternative. Again, you, you probably are familiar with this. Um, but the formal specification of third normal form, there are, depending on the textbook you use, there are two different but equivalent ways of specifying this. Uh, the version we use is uh, based on, the, is the, this is the for, uh, definition. We say that uh, schema is in third normal form if for all alpha 
determines beta in F plus, at least one of the following holds. Alpha determines beta is trivial, or alpha is a super key. So far, it's the same as BCNF. 3NF has one extra relaxation, which says each attribute A in beta minus alpha is contained in a candidate key for R. Okay. Each attribute can be in a different candidate key. But each and every attribute, if you take one at a time, it must be contained in some candidate key. Now, this sounds very weird. I mean, what is this weird thing? Why do we care about candidate keys and so forth? Um, so it's not intuitive. Uh, but it has, there is some history to it. Uh, so this is kind of a minimal relaxation, which still allows you to ensure that you can have a dependency preserving decomposition. The goal was dependency preservation at some minimal redundancy. This is the minimal kind of redundancy which you want to allow to ensure dependency preservation. That's, that's roughly the intuition, although it's not clear how this works at this point. Any questions? So the goal is to uh, take a given relation, decide if it is in good form, normal form. If not, decompose it. So there's a whole theory of functional dependencies. The first one is the closure. I already told you what the closure is. It's all the things which are implied. Now, how do we compute the closure? How do we find out what all is implied? So there are uh, several ways of doing it. One way is to use what are called um, Armstrong's axioms, those are inference rules. So we keep applying these rules until we cannot infer anything new. So there are three basic inference rules. The first one says, it's, uh, if beta subset of alpha, then alpha determines beta. This rule generates all the trivial dependencies. It's called reflexivity. The second one says if alpha determines beta, then gamma alpha determines gamma beta. This is the augmentation rule. And the last one is transitivity, which we saw earlier. If alpha determines beta, beta determines gamma, then alpha determines gamma. How do we know only these three rules are enough? Do we need some more inference rules? So that we are claiming that uh, these three are enough. If anything can at all be logically derived, you can derive it using exactly these three rules. Uh, so the proof for it is not trivial. Okay, we won't even try to do it in a course like a uh, standard course. In, in fact, you know, I have read it and I have forgotten it. Uh, it's a non-trivial proof to show that these are sufficient. You can generate a lot more inference rules using these, um, which may be useful for humans, but all of them can be derived using just three, these three rules. They are minimal. They are sound, meaning that anything that is derived is correct. That's the easy part. That's pretty obvious, in fact. Uh, the other part is complete, which says that they generate all functional dependencies that hold. And showing it's complete is the hard part. So here's an example. We want to compute things which hold on this set of rules. So I'll give you a few minutes to work out a few members, few things which one can infer from this set. Uh, bring out a piece of paper and write it out. First of all, uh, there's a lot of trivial dependencies you can generate. So you probably don't want to generate all of them. It'll take forever. So I 
we'll focus on just the non-trivial ones. Okay, I think we can uh, stop now and take, just go over the solutions, so we can move on to other topics. So, tell, uh, go ahead and suggest some of the answers. Start with the simplest ones, which can be directly derived, and then A2, A determines H. Why? Because A determines B, B determines H, so transitively A determines H. Okay, next one. A G to I. Why is that? Augment. Well, not directly augmentation. You have you have several things here. Okay, so you have uh, C G determines I, and you have A determines C. So how do you derive A G determines I from these two? Can you directly apply these? No, you have to first do augmentation. So you can, from A determines C, what can you determine, by augmentation, AG determines CG. So this step is augmentation. And then from here, uh, using this, so we can give names to these, right? If you call this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, Okay, so this is 7. So 7 is got by uh, augmentation from on um, this one, 2. Okay, so that's how you derive 7. Now from this and CG determines I, you get AG determines I by 4, 7, augmenta uh, sorry, transitivity. Okay, so that's one of the steps which you can use. Okay, what else can you derive? A to B C. How do you derive that? Now this is a new rule which you can say union rule. You know about it. From Armstrong's axioms, can you derive the union rule? Sure, you can. How do you derive it? So from A, uh, you can determine A B. How is this derived? Augmentation on 1. And now you have uh, A determines uh, C. So using augmentation on that, you can get AB determines BC. Augmentation on 2. And now combining uh, these two, A determines BC by transitivity. So let's give these numbers. Uh, this is 8. 9, 10, transitivity on 9 and 10. Okay. So, if you are a human doing this, you will say, well, it is obvious you can union the uh, right hand sides of uh, two dependencies whose left hand sides are the same. And this two step process is actually a generalized, you, you can generalize it to say that whenever the left hand uh, sides are the same, you can combine the right hand sides. So that can be added as a union rule. It is not a fundamental thing in the sense it can be derived from the other axioms, but you can add it to make derivation easier. Cg to Hi. And that is again using the same. So now I will say union rule because we just proved the union rule and use the union rule. Anything else? Sure, there are probably a few more uh, addition to the trivial. Anyone came up with anything else? A, G, H, I. Yeah. For the same uh, reason, uh, we have determined A, G uh, determines I, similarly A, G determines H, and then union it. Okay, so let's not try to go over every possible thing. Hopefully, all of you got at least a few of these. Given the above functional dependencies, a B determines B. Can you you have a few options? Cannot be inferred, can be inferred using transitivity, reflexivity, and augmentation. Augmentation. You take A determines B, augment both sides with B, you get A B determines. Or you can start from the trivial thing using reflexivity. I can also get A B determines B. You have both options. 
Okay. So the additional rules, union rule we also saw, then there is the decomposition rule. If alpha determines beta gamma, then alpha determines beta and alpha determines gamma. And pseudo transitivity is, is a small variant. If alpha determines beta and gamma beta, beta determines delta, then alpha gamma determines delta. We in fact used that. We uh, added something with the left and got uh, something just like this. Okay, so now coming to quiz question two, given this schema with just two dependencies, A determines B and B determines C, which of the following is a candidate key for R? A, A, D, A, C, we have several options. Is A a candidate key? How do you find out? You can apply Armstrong's axioms, but there is actually a simpler algorithm to find out the closure of a given set of attributes. Okay, there is a closure of all uh, fun uh, of a set of functional dependencies. But the other part, which is given a set of attributes, what all does it determine, does this set of attributes determine, can be done much more efficiently. So in this case, how do you find out what all A determines? Given A, A determines B implies that B is also determined by it. So I'll add A, B to, B to that set, A, B. Now since we have B determines C, and B is part of the set AB, I'll get ABC. Now can I add anything more to that? No. D is not a member of that. Therefore, A is, does not determine the whole scheme. It's not a, a key at all. Uh, similarly, AC, its closure of AC will give you what? ABC, same. You can't, uh, it's not a super key. How about AD? You will, because you'll get A, B, C, and D is already there, so all the things are in there. So it's a super key. A, B, D is also a super key, but it's not minimal, since A, D, it's a subset is already a super key. So the candidate key is A, D here. So that brings us to closure of attribute set. Given a set of attributes alpha, the closure of the set of attributes alpha under F, which is denoted by alpha plus, uh, is a set of all attributes that are functionally determined by alpha. And the algorithm which I just outlined, the very simple algorithm is here. You start with result equal to alpha. And now for every beta determines gamma in F, if at this point beta is a subset of result, then add gamma to result, union it to the result. So it's a very cheap check and can be done very fast. So in fact, um, we can use the attribute closure to even determine functional dependency closure. Can you give a simple uh, algorithm which is very easy to program? This can be programmed very easily. So now, supposing I've already programmed this, a function which given a set of attributes will return all the attributes that are functionally determined by it. Now can I compute F plus using this? I've given you a function. Given a set of attributes alpha, it will determine everything which is, it will give you back a set of all attributes which are functionally determined by alpha. From this, can I compute F plus? Simple, easy to code algorithm. What is it? Not using Armstrong's axioms and so on. Those are a lot more complex to code. Can do it, but there's a much easier way in this case. It's expensive in terms of runtime, but easy to code. So I hope you understood the question. I have given you a subroutine which implements this algorithm. So given a uh, input which is set of, a set of attributes, its output is the set of all attributes functionally determined by that given set of attributes. Now I want to write a main program which uses this to, to generate all of F plus. Sir, uh, we will start uh, from uh, a functional dependency. We will compute the closure of that one. And after that we will set, we will check the set of attributes uh, which is actually determinant for the others, then we will derive from that attribute, sir. Not quite. It's not enough. It's actually a fairly simple brute force algorithm. We will consider every subset of attributes. We have R, right? Set of attributes. Consider every subset of it. And on that subset, call this function. Okay, of course, there are a lot of subsets. I, like I said, runtime is high, but so what? Call this function on every possible subset of attributes. What is it going to return? 
given a subset, it will give you another subset which are functionally determined. From this, I will output a number of things which is on the left hand side that subset which I gave as input. Okay? So let us take a particular subset. Let us say I consider a particular subset um, S1 and the output is S1 plus, right? the set of all things which are determined by S1. So I can output now S1 determines S2 for every S2 subset of or equal to S1 plus. So there are a lot of these things. You don't want to generate all this huge number wherever possible. But if you need to do it, this is a simple way of doing it. Easy to code. So now I do this for every S1 subset of or uh, equal to uh, R. Output S determines sub 2 for every S2 subset of S1 plus. That is it. Just a couple of lines of code. And then a call to that other thing to determine S1 plus. Any question? So we have uh, some more slides which do closure of attribute sets. Uh, so we have uh, the same set of dependencies as before. And we compute AG plus. Result is AG initially. Now we have A goes to B. So B is added to the right hand side. And uh, also um, A goes to C, we can add that. And therefore we get A, B, C, G. And now we have uh, C, G goes to H. And so we get A, B, C, G, H. And from, we also get CG goes to I, so we get AB, CG, I. Okay? So that is the final result. Now is AG a candidate key? How do you check that? First of all, is it a super key? We can answer that question easily. The result was AB, CG, HI, which is all of R, so it is a super key. Is it a candidate key? Well, you take out one attribute at a time and check each of the result and say. And in this case, if you pull out A, what is left is G. Is G plus, uh, can, does it contain R? No. How about A plus, does it contain R? If you apply A plus, you will get B, H, C. That is it. Uh, you do not get G, H or I. Okay? So neither A plus nor G plus is a, uh, it contains all the attributes. So neither of them is a super key. Therefore, AG is a candidate key. Okay, so attribute closure is actually very easy to check. As a human, it is very easy to run that algorithm. And it is a quick way to check if something is a candidate key. This is an efficient test for candidate keys. So now, attribute closure can be used for many things. The first was checking of super key. We saw that. Um, and then how do we check if, if you are given a particular functional dependency, if you want to check if it is there in F plus, how can you do it? I have given you F. I give you one more functional dependency. And I ask you, is this functional dependency in F plus? So that's actually easy. So given a new functional dependency, alpha goes to beta, just compute alpha plus using the given original set of dependencies F, not using this one, using the original dependencies. Now, if beta is contained in alpha plus, we know that the original set of dependencies have shown that uh, whenever two things are equal on alpha, they will be equal on beta also. Uh, so uh, alpha goes to beta is a member of F plus. This is something important. We will be using it later in 3NF uh, synthesis algorithm and so forth. So we will take a dependency and check if it holds by doing alpha plus and seeing if beta is contained. If you have any doubts about this, ask now. It is a cheap test. And then computing closure of F, we just saw. For each gamma subset of R, compute gamma plus. For each S subset of gamma plus, output gamma determines F.
with what we just did. So now, uh, sufficient condition for lossless join, this we are kind of rewinding, we saw this before. Uh, you remember what is the definition of lossless join? A sufficient condition is that one of the tables, common attribute, is a super key of one of the two decomposed tables. So in other words, either R1 intersection R2 determines R1 or R1 intersection R2 determines R2. These are the two choices. Uh, I mean, at least one of these must be true. Both may be true, that's okay. Now, how do you know this is lossless join? We discussed that before. Right? We said that if you take a particular tuple here, it can only match one tuple there. So it's a sufficient condition. Is it a necessary condition? Turns out that if you only restrict the thing to functional dependencies, it's necessary. But functional dependencies are not the only kind of constraints that we have. There's something called multi-value dependency, which we'll come to, which you probably know about. And we actually generalize this in the context of multi-value. So there may be a situation where a multi-value dependency holds, but not a functional dependency. And decomposition is still lossless. Uh, if you consider only functional dependencies, it's necessary. OK, now let's take uh, another useful example. A, B, C. A determines B, B determines C. Now you can decompose this in two different ways. What are the two ways? Lossless decomposition, of course. What are the two ways? A, B, A, C. B, C and B, A. One of them is A, B, B, C. So how did we do this? We took a, a functional dependency. So the way it, uh, to prove this is lossless, we can show that uh, because A determines B, the common thing is B here. And because we have B determines C, we know that this is lossless join. Why did we choose to decompose it? If you remember the BCNF decomposition algorithm, we picked one of these. Maybe um, in, the, in this case, uh, we picked B determines C. And the relations we got were BC and ABC minus C, which is AB. So that's what we got. It's clearly lossless join. We saw that. Is it dependency preserving? Yes. In fact, if you see the original set of AB and BC, that can the first relation you can check AB, the second one you can check BC. However, there's another decomposition which if you start by decomposing on AB. Now, what happens? AB is one relation. The other one is ABC minus B, which is AC. Is it lossless join? Yes. The common part is A. It determines B. But it's not dependency preserving. Why? There is a functional dependency. B determines C. Can you check it? on the individual ones. What are the dependencies that hold on the individual ones? On the first one, A determines B holds. On the second one, what functional dependencies can hold? Does anything hold, first of all? Does any functional dependency hold on the second one? A determines C holds. It's not in the given set. A, B, B, C does not contain A determines C. But we can infer it. And A determines C, uh, both sides of it are contained in yeah, R, the second R2 here, which is AC. Therefore, A determines C can, does hold on it, and you can check it. You can make sure that no two tuples are there which agree on A but not on C. However, we can create a state of this thing where B determines C is violated. How do we do that? We can add a tuple. Uh, supposing um, we add uh, the following tuples. We want A, B, and B, C. So we want to violate, we want to see that it can violate B determines C. So maybe we can add um, 1, 2, and 2, 2. Does, uh, what is the dependency here? A determines B. Does it hold? Sure, it does. Over here, I have. Uh, one, um, say, three, and two, four. What is the dependency here? A determines C. Does it hold? Yes. If we join it, what are the tuples we get? We'll get one, two, three, and 
2, 2, 4. Now on this, if you see B, C, these two tuples have the same value for B, but different values for C. Okay, so the join violates this dependency, B determines C. So we could check A determines C here, A determines B there. If we only check these two, we may allow an update or an insert to happen, which results in violation of B determines C. This could never happen if we had chosen the other decomposition. So that other decomposition, dependency preserving decomposition is clearly better. You would not choose this if you could choose that. So formally, uh, uh, decomposition is dependency preserving if um, you take, let F1, Fi in general, be the set of dependencies in F plus that only include attributes of Ri. So those are the only ones which can be efficiently checked locally on each of the array. I have taken R, I have broken it up into R1, R2, up to Rn. Now I am seeing what all can be checked locally on each of those. Now if I take the union of these local ones and take the closure, if it is equal to F plus, then I know that if I check these, it's enough. The other ones will definitely hold. Okay, that if this is true, then the decomposition is dependency preserving. But as we saw the previous one, that de decomposition is not dependency preserving. Uh, this particular one is BCNF. Uh, this decomposition is BCNF, lossless join, and dependency preserving. The other one is not dependency preserving.